Okay, we will start until we figure out the technical stuff. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. It's good, be, good to be with you guys this evening on our fourth rendition of this series that we started four weeks ago, or actually five weeks ago. We took a little break between week one and week three, or week two, rather. Um, we've been discussing the Sermon on the Mount, and we have been saying that the summit is known as the chapters of Matthew from 5 to 7, which reminds us of the Ten Commandments of old, which were given on Mount Sinai. So we said that the Gospel of St. Matthew is written to a Jewish audience, and it's written in order to sort of show how Christ is the fulfillment of the law and how he is the one who came to perfect the law and to teach us how we ought to live um, and walk in his footsteps. So where have we been over the last few weeks? We went through a pretty long journey. We went through the Beatitudes. We went through the historical context of this, um, these three chapters. We've been through, uh, last week we talked about the, um, you have heard it said, but I tell you. Um, we've been through a lot, and we went pretty much only through Matthew chapter 5 in the last three weeks. So today my goal is to go through half of, half of chapter 6. Next week we'll go through the remainder of chapter 6, and then hopefully one more week and finish chapter 7. It's my hope. Chapter 7 may take me two weeks. Um, but I want to tell you guys that um, this could take seven weeks, eight weeks. Like we, if we really want, like last week, the last four verses of chapter five, we flew through. That in itself could be like a very long discussion for us to really uh, dig deep through. But my goal is, is for us to take like a, a zoomed out approach on this and for all of you to really dig deep into it yourselves. Y'all are all young adults, young professionals. You, you have the capacity to be able to do a deep study on these three chapters on your own and really take a thousand more treasures than I shared with you over the last three weeks. So let's just recap really quickly that Matthew writes the gospel like Torah, um, like a law. His audience is an audience that's under Roman occupation, and they are impoverished and in a mourning, mourning their state of being occupied. And the mountains, when he says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, Mountains have a spiritual significance for the listeners, right? Moses received the law on the mountain. Jesus went on a mountain. It to be, he was tempted on a mountain. He gave the Sermon on the Mount on a mountain. There are a variety of... Elijah went up on a mountain. There are so many different spiritual characters that have received something beautiful from God on a mountain. So mountains elicit this idea to the listener that there's something special that's happening. But what we've really zoomed in on over the last few weeks is Jesus is really concerned about our hearts. He's really concerned about the heart of the matter. When, he, when God gave the law to the people, he gave them sort of a zoomed out perspective of you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not. He gave a bunch of you shall nots, right? And when Jesus is coming and sharing, for example, in the end of chapter 5, he's telling them, you have heard it said, right? You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that if you even look at wo a woman with lust in your eyes, you've already committed adultery. So he's, tr he's taking the, 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 the law and transcending the law and saying, I don't even want to get you to the point of the adultery. I want to work on your heart before it gets to that point. I want to focus on the deeper issues that manifest the sin that I've been trying to tell you for 2,000 years to not do. And every time God gives a law, man breaks it. So Christ is trying to get us to a deeper understanding that is the heart is what causes us to do the things that we do. When God enters into the heart and when God refines the heart and purifies the heart, that way, that's why we say in Psalm 50, create in me a clean heart of God or renew a right spirit within me because we recognize that the heart is really what leads us to do things that we often don't want to do. So where are we going today? Today we're going to really address this idea of spiritual posing. This idea of the external being one way and the internal being completely different. I spoke about this for like a half a second in the servants retreat, but Matthew chapter 6 really, really digs in onto this idea of spiritual posing. That outwardly I look somewhere, I come, I pray, I do all these different things, and people see the things that I do. But inward, there's a whole mess that's going on. And not to say that the inward can't have stuff going on, because it always will have stuff. But if the outward is a drastic difference from what's going on in the inside, then maybe there's something that needs to make the bridge, something that needs to bridge the gap between the two. 
And he speaks about hypocrisy. And we, I don't know if you guys have heard this before, but a hypocrite is historically, in Greek plays, Hippocrates is one who wears a mask, right? There's this understanding that a, a hypocrite was one who was scared of being able to present himself in the way that he wanted to present himself. So they, he was afraid, so he'd put on a mask, right? So is an actor playing a role, someone wearing a mask to misrepresent reality? So we're going to talk about this idea of spiritual posing today. We're going to talk about this idea of the outward not necessarily re reflecting the inward. And we're going to hope that maybe, you know, we all together as a group can so sort of bridge the gap between the two. So, the first portion of Matthew chapter 6, okay? So, who wants to read this for us? Mark, can you pass the microphone to Mark? Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. When you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Matthew 6, 1-4. through four. What do you guys think of this? First four verses of Matthew. Again, we talked about the Sermon on the Mount being like, the, this is the longest discourse of Christ. So what he says in these three chapters are significant. So why does he start chapter 6 with this idea of charitable works? What stands out in these first four verses to you guys? Let's make this a little bit more dynamic. I underlined something, so gave you a little bit of things to... Even with the things underlined? Come on, guys, help, help a brother out. Chapter 5 was all about the do nots, um, and Jesus pointing us away from saying, okay, well, you know, I haven't murdered, I haven't committed adultery, so I guess I'm good, uh, to pointing us inward at the state of our hearts. Similarly, these are things that God wants us to do, to uh, give alms, and a couple other things are going to come along, fasting, prayer, but um, the idea here is, okay, what is the intent behind what you're doing? And I think this also ties back to earlier on in chapter 5 where uh, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. Uh, and there we are supposed to, uh, what's the phrasing? Let your good works shine before others so that they may see. Uh, wait. Let your light so shine before Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works. They may, that they may see your good works and gl give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Mm. So the question is, how are you doing your works to be seen? Hmm. That's a, actually, I'm glad you brought that up because some people would read this passage, which as I was studying this today, how do, you how do you reconcile the two, right? Like he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Then he says here, take heed, do not, let, no, do, not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. And do not sound the trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. And do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So it seems like he's saying, let your light so shine in one chapter. And then the next chapter he's saying, hide everything that you're doing. Is that what's being said here? What do you guys think? Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you. I think you need to have like humility. And through your acts um, and like walking in a life of Christ, then that's when other people feel Christ or see Christ or like experience him while we're here on earth. But in reality, you're not supposed to do it. Like your pride can really take away from your actions. That's why in this specific chapter, it's like stating <coughs> to not show like others or be like, <coughs> you know, okay. wanting attention. Okay. Okay. What else do you guys think? I like that. Thank you, Sarah. <coughs> Sorry, I've had this cough for like three weeks. Forgive me. I'm trying not to, to shut off the microphone while I'm hacking a lung. Um, so does it seem from this 
these first four verses, that the theme of the heart is continuing to you guys? Does it seem like there is a continuity of intent of why we do what we do? Because he's, who is the hypocrites that he's talking about in this? Like he's saying very clearly, before you, therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound the trumpet before you as the hypocrites do. Hypocrites are ones who wear a mask by definition, but who are the hypocrites that he's referring to? The Pharisees. There's like a whole chapter in Matthew chapter 23 dedicated to the Pharisees. Like it is a brutal passage. You do not want to be a Pharisee in the time of Jesus because there is like this, it seems like he's very, very vocal about the Pharisees. So who are the Pharisees? Let's go through it a little bit. In Matthew chapter 23, I only took three of the verses in Matthew chapter 23. Who wants to read this? Small font, but maybe one of you guys can read it because it really will contextualize a little bit of what Matthew chapter 6 is trying to say. Woe to you, oh, scribes and Pharisees, <laughs> hypocrites. <laughs> Benjamin, you scared me. Man. <laughs> oh, my Lord. <laughs> I almost peed myself right there. <laughs> right, For you ben. cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of ex extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside may then be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Mm. Thank you for that very, very, very <laughs> expressive. That's probably the way Jesus would have said it. So thank you, Benjamin. I appreciate that. Although you scared every inch of me in that moment, but thank you. <clears throat> so who are the Pharisees? Who are the Pharisees, guys? What's the role of the Pharisees? What are they supposed to do? Who are they supposed to be? What's their role in society? Pharisees are, there. if we were to like sort of give a modern day sort of role, the role of a Pharisee is that of the role of like a clergyman, right? A person of the cloth, right? Like I'm, I could be a Pharisee. Right? Technically, Pharisee by title is not supposed to be a bad thing. It got associated with bad thing. A Pharisee is someone who is supposed to keep the law, lead the people to worship, guide them through their example. But somehow they missed the goal of what their role was supposed to be. And Christ gets, he, he seems really, really upset. He's outraged by the Pharisees, like small mindedness and their inability and unwillingness to distinguish from that which was essential to that which was secondary, that which is necessary for people and that which is sort of a byproduct of their faith. He's outraged by the fact that they do one thing and live completely different behind the scenes. And actually, when you think of contextualize this within the modern world today, what's the biggest gripe that people have with Christians? Is they call Christians hypocrites, right? Like the, people often say, I'm over like religion, because religion produces hypocrisy. I'm over being part of a church because every time I enter into a church, there's a bunch of people that say one thing and live drastically different than what they say. So, you know, even Gandhi says, I love your Christ, but I hate Christians, right? Because you Christians are not like your Christ. So there is this, this like sort of dichotomy that sometimes happens between people of faith where they want to do one thing, but they live drastically different. And there's a difference between desire and intent, right? That Pharisees were thinking that they were doing the right thing, but, dra but in actuality, people were so far from God as a result of them. And he says it very clean, clearly. For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of extortion and self-indulgence. What's extortion? Anyone know what extortion is? Nobody knows what extortion is? It's like corruption, but it's even more than that. It's like, sorry? Pressuring people. For like you're, you're, you are manipulating things in order to take advantage of people. It's not even like, it's like I know what I'm doing and I'm intentionally twisting it to extort. Like, you know what they charge mafiosos with? Extortion, right? Like mobsters. 
they would like twist your arm and say, like, I'll never forget this in New York. My parents, immigrant parents, moving to New York City, started a, a small business. And they had a, a hair salon. And, you know, Staten Island, where I grew up, is known for, for the mafia. Um, and, you know, my Middle Eastern parents, these people come and they say, you know, hey, how you doing? You know, we're here to provide you pr to protection. So my parents go, we don't need protection. <laughs> we have Jesus. We don't need protection. <laughs> and the guy is like, no, no, we, we, take, we protect all of the neighborhood, you know? And long story short, my parents are like, we're not paying for protection. We don't need protection. We are fine. And then they proceeded to have like the glass of their windows destroyed, their, build, their, their, their hair salon vandalized. Um, and it was like this whole, I remember being a young kid and having this debacle about like, mom, dad, just pay the guys. Just like, you know, you guys don't understand who these people are. They're going to kill you. Long story short, right after they, you know, they, uh, the New York City mayor cracked down on the Gambino crime family and all of that went to the, the background. Anyway, I digress. I like, I like uh, mafia sort of stuff, the history of the mafia. It's fascinating. Um, but anyway, the, the, the mobsters extort people. Totally off topic, forgive me. Um, blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that the outside may also be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautifully outward, but inside are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanliness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So Christ is very, very vocal about the Pharisees and how the issues that he has. And if you go to Matthew chapter 23, he has a lot of feelings about it. And he probably said it, again, the same way that Benjamin said it in the microphone, screaming, yelling at them, telling them, like, whoa, yelling at them, wanting them to know the, 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 the stupidity of how they were acting. So the Gospel of Matthew, like the other Gospels, is full of accounts between Jesus and the Pharisees. Evidently, the Pharisees were his main opponents. He constantly rebuked them. What was it about them that outraged Jesus most of all? It was the fact that their piety was for show and merely external. It was not accompanied by the inner cultivation of the self that Jesus placed at the center of his moral teaching. Jesus' focus is all about changing people's hearts. If we change people's hearts, then the outward becomes different. If we focus on the root cause of why people do the heinous things they do in the world, then the heinous things won't happen. If I tell you, do not murder, and you do not murder, good job. But let me stop. stop. Let me get you before you even get to the point of murder, and let me get to you having murdered your brother in your heart before you actually murder him externally. So he's focused on the inner, and the Pharisees are all focused on the outward. So naturally, there is this like, juxtaposition that happens between the two, right? There is this battle that's happening. So what is this idea of the sound of the trumpet and the right hand? Historically, anyone know the sound of the trumpet? Like why he's, if you go back to this passage, he's saying, do not sound a trumpet. And then he says, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. What, what, is, what is this about? Anyone know historically contextualizing it, what the sound of a trumpet is? Why would they sound the trumpet? Huh? Sorry? Sorry? Okay, fair. Yeah, if you look at the historical Old Testament, there's, they'd sound the trumpet, and, you know, Gideon, and there's Joshua, and there's all these other people with the sound of the trumpet. But historically, the trumpet, the expression refers to the particular widespread company, a custom of announcing in the synagogue the name and the donor and the amount of, that was donated. So anytime somebody would enter into the temple and they would make a donation, they would sound the trumpet. So the rich people would be very well known. Meanwhile, the poor, when they would offer, they would also sound the trumpet and they would make it very known how little they would donate. So you see there is like this, like you Pharisees started this like sound of the trumpet to elevate the people that don't need to be elevated anymore. Like these people already are in the high places of society and what you're doing is you're supposed to be taking any offering that any person, you even know the widow of the two mites, right? Why does Christ care so much about the widow with the two mites who offers the last of all that she has? Because she, what she had 
was of more value to her than the rich person who makes the huge donation. So the sound of the trumpet is these people are basically okaying the fact that we're elevating wealthy people in the synagogue and making their donation greater than those who have nothing and are making a donation. You with me? Context matters. What about the right hand? The meaning of this expression is that a person having done a good deed must forget about it as soon as possible, neither announcing it nor taking pride in it. So it's not that I literally don't let my right hand know. Like I remember my parents would one time teach me when I was a kid, like if you're going and you have money in your pocket and you're going to put it in the donation box, just like grab it and don't even look what you're giving. And I'd be like, what if it's like a hundred dollar bill? I'm like, what if I don't, I need the money. Like I should know what I'm like, <laughs> you know, my parents would be, you just go in your pocket, you grab whatever money comes out and then you put it in. And it's not about like going into the pocket and not knowing. It's about this idea of when you do something, immediately forget about it. Like, don't make it a thing. Don't go tell people, oh, I did something so great today. Like, ain't I so awesome? You know, I went and I fed the homeless last week. You know, I actually, my co colleague was so annoying, and I was extra loving and kind to them today. Like, there is this idea that sometimes we like to parade the good things that we do. But Jesus is saying, in the same way that we don't like the Pharisees sounding the trumpet, also be careful to not let yourself sound your own trumpet before men. Right, like maybe you don't have literally a, a trumpet, but when you do something good, you really want to let people know, right? So be careful, be careful. Don't make it such a thing. Saint Clement of Alexandria says he says if you give alms, it is said let no one know it. If you give alms, don't let anyone know about it, right? And I know again there is this like sometimes we'll even spiritualize it. Like let me tell you, like every week I go and I do this and this and this and this. Come with me one time. You know, it's like there is even an element in that that is about me. You following me? So you see the heart of the matter here is Jesus is really cares about not making spectacles, right? Even in the way that he entered into the world, how did he enter into the world? Not in a, in a skeptical, in a spectacle. He came in the lowliest of low places. So he's trying to encourage his disciples to say, hey, listen, if I came in the lowest state and I stayed in the lowest state and not like, I'm not talking about financially. I'm talking about like, I didn't parade myself in glory. I could have been born as a king. I could have done everything and elevated myself to the highest place, but I took the lowest place. So if you want to be like my disciples, if you want to be like me, if you want to follow my footsteps, don't be like those who sound the trumpet. Don't be like those who parade the good works that they do. Do what you need to do in secret. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. So then he gets into this next whole discourse about prayer. And we'll get through this together. Let's talk about prayer. And when you pray, who wants to read this? I'm going to move faster from here because I'm talking too much. Go ahead, Andrew. Behind you. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners <coughs> of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have <coughs> their reward. But you, when you go pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain <coughs> repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. What do you think about this? Similar theme, right? Similar theme. What do you think? But also feels kind of like, I have a lot of questions about being orthodox, don't I? Right? Like a lot of people will take this passage and will like have a field day with us because they misunderstand who we are and what our intent is right so look at this and tell me what you think the heart of the matter is is it about praying outwardly is it about communal worship is it about repeating certain prayers over and over again what's what's the What's the heart of the matter here? Go ahead, Marina. Um, I, I think to 
for me, um, God, like, I think we live, we live in a world where everything has to be open and, you know, who, who, who exactly who you are and, and show your achievements in everything that you do, mm. um, in, in all aspects, whether family, work, and even church. Mm. Um, and I think God really wants us to move away from that. And I think that's the struggle. We live in a world so open, and if you're not open, you're there's yeah. something wrong. <laughs> yeah, we live in a world with a lot of outside. Go yeah. ahead, sorry. And and then so we have so God is telling us no, you have to be with me alone in this small place together, face to face. And I think with me personally in my spiritual life, I think that. God wants us to be face to face with him and mm. the less space we have we, we like for example me and him the more intimate we are to understand each other and strengthen mm. our relationship the more crowd there is with other people the le the more far away I'm, I am from him because of the so many distractions yeah in the world so I think prayer is one of them like like yeah. before, he's like everything in secret. Yeah. Okay. I like that. What else? Go ahead, Andrew. Um, similarly, I was going to say, I think prayer is very personal. So what prayer someone says might work for you or for someone else, but not for yourself. So when he's talking about, you know, don't do it, vain repetitions, short, like, you were saying like the church might have things that guide us and help us pray but if you're just doing it to kind of a facade of you know this is very verbose this is like i'm trying to look good then it doesn't really mean anything but if you really mean it in your heart and that prayer means something to you then it's personal then it's a relationship yeah. with god yeah mm. yeah yeah it's not really about the words again it's about the intent right <coughs> But let's actually, let's actually dig into it a little bit. So this idea of many words, right? The meaning of this word verb can be conveyed by the words heap up empty phrases, using a lot of meaningless words, speaking stammeringly or saying the same thing over and over again. So it definitely, first and foremost, Jesus is definitely not saying like public prayer is an issue. Because the fact is he went to the temple and he prayed publicly, right? Like he was in the temple once or several times a year during his ministry. And what would people do when they'd go to the temple? They'd worship together and they'd offer prayers, right? His harsh criticism is directed at the specific aspects of the behavior of the Pharisees in places where people gather for prayer, right? They outwardly do certain things to make their prayers seem a certain way to like impress people around them they use vain repetitions to show the, the the volume of or the length of their prayers right again it's all about like if the inner room matches the outward if the inner room matches what's happening vocally there's no issue but there are many of us that come to church every single sunday and love to pray communally but we don't pray by ourselves with the lord we have no inner room. There are many of us that love to go to prayer meetings and go to worship sessions and do all these different things. But, I, but to go pray by yourself and to have that inner dialogue and relationship with God, I don't want it, right? I'm telling you, even as like a priest now, it's a struggle, right? Because, you know, I, I used to love like my prayer time, but now my, the time that I have is very slim and limited, right? So it's much easier to spend time with people and to pray together as a group and to lead people in liturgical worship and to do all these but what good is it for me to lead the whole community in worship when i don't even have a relationship with jesus personally where i know his voice where i sit with him where i love to be in his presence like what good is that and i think that's the struggle for many of us is there is definitely a beauty and an encouragement that comes from being together right nobody's hating on the togetherness but if the togetherness doesn't lead to the privateness, like, because Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship, 
right? So if the relationship is not established and the communal is impacting the private, then what good is all the prayer meetings, all the liturgies, all the things, if it doesn't draw, draw me into deeper loving encounter with God? Like, what good is that? So he's definitely not talking about public prayer, and he's not talking about repetitive prayer. He's talking about, like, does the inner match the outward? Does the private ma manifest the public? Does the stuff that we do behind closed doors reflect wh how the way that we live when we are around our brothers and sisters? So don't we use vain repetition among prayer as Orthodox Christians? So, <coughs> again, his harsh criticism is directed at the specific aspect of the behavior of the Pharisees. And aside from this, nowhere does Jesus oppose prolonged prayer, neither in the Sermon on the Mount nor anywhere else. The admonition to not use vain repetition in prayer does not mean that prayer cannot be prolonged. Jesus himself sometimes spent entire nights in prayer. Right, so it's not about the length, it's about the intent. You guys with me? Okay, so let's move a little bit quicker. I'll skip this quote just for the sake of time. So there is a psychologist named Soren Kierkegaard. Can somebody read this uh, quote? It's a long quote, um, but I think it's really powerful. Can somebody read it? It's small text, but there was please pay attention to the words. There was something that was very much on his mind, a matter that was so important for him to have God understand properly. He was afraid that he might have forgotten something in his prayer. Alas, and if he had forgotten it, he was afraid that God would not have remembered it an, on his own. Therefore, he wanted to gather his thoughts and pray truly fervently. And then, if he in fact prayed truly fervently, what happened to him? Something strange and wonderful happened to him. Gradually, as he became more and more fervent in prayer, he had less and less to say. And finally, he became entirely silent. He became silent. Indeed, he became what is, if possible, even more the opposite of talking than silence. He became a listener. He had thought that to pray was to talk. He learned that to pray is not only to keep silent, but to listen. And that is how it is. To pray is not to listen to oneself speak, but is to come to keep silent and to continue keeping silent, to wait until the person who prays hears God. Very powerful quote. He's saying about what he thought about prayer. He thought that initially when he prayed, he had to like gather all his thoughts and have this like perfectly orchestrated prayer because God forbid he forgot a certain prayer and lest God, not, he might, God might not know what he really wants and needs. Like the, the initial phase, like, elementary prayer is that I go to God because I want something or need something from him. And then over time, he started to realize that the more and more he spent in the presence of God, he stopped actually necessarily needing to say anything because he understood that the character of God was that the more he was in his presence, the more that he stopped actually talking and just wanted to listen and just wanted to understand what was on the heart of God. And once he understood what was on the heart of God, he began to actually know what to pray for. Like, it, it's this, like, and it's not even prayer was this vocal experience. It was actually sitting in the presence of God and being in the presence of God and encountering him. So I think this is, like, I love this quote as I was reading it today because it really, I think, of, has expressed what I have struggled with in prayer. Like, when I pray, does God not know what I already want? Does God not already know what's the desires of my heart? Do I actually even need to ask him for it? So what is prayer? Prayer is just being in the presence of God in a relationship, that shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder time, that like encounter, that like longing desire to be with him, right? And it's not that I'm coming to him with all these requests and I need him to go through a checklist. It's that, God, I just, I'm happy being with you and knowing that you're with me, and me just knowing that you're with me makes me feel safe and makes me know that all the things that I'm worried about are all going to be handled by you. I don't even need to ask them because you're a dad and you love me. And because you love me, I know you got me. I know you got me. So I'm here to listen, to understand what your desires are, because when I understand what your desires are, I can go out and I can be who you desire me to be. So I guess from these first four verses, we only went through four verses, or s seven verses, sorry. What are our reasons for doing what we do? Is it to get attention? Is it to make ourselves look good? 
Is it to get something in return? Is it to avoid feeling guilty? Like, what are the motivations, right? And why is this important? Because if we do what we do with the wrong intent, then why are we doing what we're doing? Right? If we do what we do for the applause of others, you can get applause elsewhere. Like, it doesn't need to be in a church context. You can, like, get your applause from your coworkers. Like, why are we doing what we're doing? Like, what's the benefit? What's the motivation here? Are our reasons the right reasons? So how can we make sure that we're doing what we're doing for the right reasons? Ask yourself, why are you doing what you're doing? Know your why. Why am I doing what I'm doing? That's in everything in life. By the way, this is like a principle that the world has taken from us. Like, what is the reasons? What's your why? Like, it's a big thing that the culture is talking about. Know your why. Know your motivation. Know your intent for why you do what you do, right? And be honest with yourself, right? Be honest. Like, if, I'm, if my motivation for coming to church is I'm just, like, looking to appear piously so that chick can know that I am attractive or that guy can know that I'm good-looking or that, like, outward piety is for the sake of, like, a, 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 a ulterior motive, then be careful. Be careful. Because who are you deceiving? Like, who are you deceiving? Are you deceiving God? Like, God knows the heart. So actually, you're being ingenuine, and you're deceiving yourself. And also, you see how Jesus speaks about this. Like, he's pretty vocal about the outward not looking like the inward and doing things with ulterior motives and not having the right intent and purpose. Like, this is what really, really, like, in, really from the scriptures makes Christ not happy, right? If we can even use those words, like, because God is dispassionate, like, but when you can, you can, the, the way that he expresses himself about people who do things for the wrong reasons. But when I ask myself why I'm doing things, and I'm honest, then I can actually focus on the needs of others, because I'm not the center of everything. You with me? You with me? 826. I still have a lot to talk about. Should we keep going? You guys sure? All right, I'll try to go through this fast. So are we doing this to get attention? Are we doing this to get attention? Are we do is our motivation to get attention or is our motivation to be in loving union with God? And if our motivation is loving union with God, you are more fueled to pray than you've ever prayed before. If our motivation is to be in the presence of God, we're more fueled to care for our neighbor than anyone else is because I know that God cares for my neighbor. I know that when he, he explicitly says in Matthew chapter 25, when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you visited me. For the least you did to my brethren, you did to me. Christ makes the Christian need to have a heart for other people. Right? Like, if you care for other people, you are caring for me. Like nobody elevates the, 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 the ostracized in society as much as Christ does. Christ basically makes the least of the brethren himself. So if you want to know the heart of God, the intent of God, is he's saying care for the least, the forgotten, the ones that don't, aren't cared for in society. Those are the ones that I desire. Those are the ones that I have a heart for. And when I have that heart, I have the heart of Jesus. And how much more does our world need that? How much more does our world need people who care about the heart of Christ? People who are not outward, but inwardly being sanctified. So then he goes on to the next portion, which goes right into the Lord's Prayer, which seems like, whoa, what is, where, how do you transition to the Lord's Prayer? Like, how do you go from these first verses to jump? Like, where do you think the bridge is here? But when you pray, say, our Father who are in heaven. That's how he starts. But when you pray, let me tell you how you ought to pray. Where is the connection here, ladies and gentlemen? The most famous prayer in Christianity that Jesus taught us to pray is transitioned from these first pretty tough verses. Where's the bridge? Yeah. 
Fair enough. I think it's deeper than that. I think it's, it's again, because he's, it's when you know that I am your father, when you know that you are loved by me, when you have that relationship with me, then all the stuff that I said you shouldn't do doesn't happen. Like when you understand your sonship, when you understand your identity, when it's crystal clear to you who you are in Christ, right? Like our fuel for not doing things is not because we're scared of God. Our fuel for not doing things is because we love God. And because we love God so much, we're motivated to do what's on his heart. You with me? So he says, our father who are in heaven. Well, how, do we, how can we even call God father? This, this statement, our father in heaven, is not utilized in scripture before this moment. It's just not. Like it's no, the, the, the Jewish people never addressed God as father. It's like, not okay. Like, don't do that. Even, like, remove letters, call him Elohim, like, never call him God. They put, like, G space D. Like, there is this distance between God and man, right? So Christ come, comes and says, the only way that you can call God Father is through me. Because it's only in Christ that we have become adopted into the family of Christ. Even when you look at this, the statement of the Father in heaven, or literally in the heavens, means that he is everywhere and over all things. The heavens are over all and encompass all. And wherever man goes on the earth or in the air or even in space, the heavens are around him and over him. To say that God is in heaven is not to place him somewhere. It's rather to say that he transcends all things and yet is present to all. What is that quote even saying? It's saying that when you call him Father... Not only is he the God of the universe, but he's right here. Like, he becomes your daddy. He becomes your relationship. He becomes your person that you can cling to. He's not a God who's distant anymore. He's not a God that you need to use alternative words to address him. You call him father. You call him the, 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 the title that is addressed for the dearest, the most intimate relationship that you have. Hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What's hallowed be your name? I'm going to just... We pray, hallowed be thy name, not that we wish that God be made holy by our prayers, but that his name may be hallowed in us. It's saying, if you're my father, because you're my father, I want people to see my good works and glorify you. I want people to look at me and to see you. In effect, he's saying, enable us to live so purely that through us all may glorify you. Your kingdom come, your will be done. What is your kingdom come, your will be done? On earth as it is in heaven. I'm going to move a little faster. St. Gregory of Anissa says, When therefore we stand to say to God, Thy will be done also in me, it is entirely necessary to first to condemn the manner of conduct which is lived outside the divine will and fully own up to it in confession. Lord, take pity on my lostness and grant at last that your will be done in me. Just as the darkness vanishes when light is brought into the dark caves, so also when your will is done in me, every evil and every improper movement of my will vanishes into nothing. What is the Lord's will? To make me more like him. To make me more like him. Again, if we embody Jesus, what is the world going to look like? It's going to be drastically different. Like if we are like him, if we're saying thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, I want this world to be holy like you. I want this world to be transformed by your presence. I want this world to see me and to glorify you. And glorify you. I want to, the world to be transformed by the love that they encounter by encountering me. Give us this day our daily bread. Later on, he's going to say, do not worry about what you should eat or you should drink. So what does give us this day our daily bread mean? Why should we pray for food? Is it about food? First, in a temporal, like our time here on earth, this word means to confirm us in trust without reservation. 
In a qualitative sense, it signifies what is necessary for life, M more broadly, in every good thing sufficient for subsistence. But literally, like the literal word that's used here is the word usayya, epi usayya, which is this like super essential bread. What he's saying is, give us this day more Jesus. Jesus is the bread of life, which came down from heaven. Give us this day more Jesus. Not give us this day food, because he's your father. He'll give you food. Like he, like even in the places where there's so much poverty, he provides. He provides. And by the way, I read a stat one time that says there's enough food on earth for every single person to have a 5,000 calorie diet. And the problem is greed. The problem is we don't know how to use our resources that is given. So you want God to end world hunger? And he says, what are you doing about it? Like, what are you doing about making sure that people are fed and hungry? Right? So this is not about food. This is about the medicine of immortality. This is about asking Jesus to be our food. And for him, if we have enough of him every single day, then we have all that we need. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He asks us to bring our sins to remembrance and to ask for forgiveness, and he teaches us how to obtain remission. He makes the way uncomplicated, St. John Chrysostom says. By this rule of supplication, it is clear that it is impossible even after the font of baptism that our offenses may still be washed away. He thereby persuades us to be modest, commands us to forgive others, sets us to be free from vengeful, vengeful obsessions, promises pardon, and holds before us good hopes and high view of the unspeakable mercy of God. Great quote. Again, I'm not going to dwell too much on it because I think it speaks for itself. You want forgiveness? You have to forgive. You want God to pardon you? You got to pardon. We've talked about forgiveness so much in this meeting. Like, I think I harp on forgiveness more than any person. Like, I, I, because I think most of our issues relationally happen because we have an inappropriate understanding of forgiveness. And we have an inappropriate understanding of how much God has done for us and how much God forgives us time and time again. So I'm not going to dwell on it too much, but I think that quote, take a picture of it if you want to look at it later, it's a great one. So lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God, don't allow us to find ourselves in situations where we're overcome with sin. That's what he's saying here. I'm going to move a little bit faster. I'm going to skip some quotes. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. So life of blessing means seeking God's kingdom, relying on his power, and living for his glory. I'm going to summarize this whole prayer from this quote from Archbishop Anthony Bloom, which I think is the most beautiful. He takes the prayer and he reverses it. So he says, and this is the final slide, I promise. Delivered from evil, man is saved from temptation. In so doing, he is merciful to all and receives the forgiveness of his own sins. Being forgiven by his sins, he, by his mercy to others, he has all that he needs for life, his daily bread. And being nourished by God, he accomplishes his will. And having accomplished his will, God's kingdom is present, his name is sanctified, and he becomes the father of the one who shows himself to be, in truth, the child of God who can say, our father. Isn't that the most beautiful quote? Isn't that the most beautiful quote? He's basically giving us the understanding of how we ought to pray this prayer. If we reverse it, we understand it. Because we are delivered, we are saved from temptation. And because we're saved from temptation, we are merciful. And because we're, we've received forgiveness, we give forgiveness. Because we've encountered Christ and we have enough of our daily bread. And because we're nourished by God, we go out and we accomplish his will. And having accomplished his will, his kingdom is present amongst us. And because his kingdom is present, his name is sanctified. And he becomes the father of the one who shows himself to be, in truth, the child of God and who can say, our father. So, chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, we're done. I want to ask you, my final slide, do you want to continue climbing? I think most of us at this point will say, Jesus, you're asking too much. You're asking too much. It's a lot. It's too much. I can't do this. But I'll tell you guys, I will tell you guys, the greatest, greatest, greatest thing is climbing this mountain. Because you're not climbing it alone. He's carrying you on his shoulders, and he's doing the climbing with you. He's not telling you to do something that he himself hasn't done. 
and he's not inspiring you to do something that he knows won't change your life and the whole world around you. So I encourage you guys to take five and six and really try your best to apply this because there's a lot that was said tonight, but what I really want us to hone in on is where are your hearts? Are you spiritually posing? Are you spiritually posing? Because if you're spiritually posing, if you're coming to church just to let people say some nice things about you, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. I don't want to hear those words. <laughs> like, I really don't want to hear those words one day before I stand before my, my master. I hope he says, well done, good and faithful servant. I hope he says to me, which by the grace of God he will, he said, come you, blessed my father, inherit the, the kingdom which was prepared for you from the foundation of the earth. Come, inherit the many mansions which are prepared for you. Come to the place where there is no mourning, no tears, no suffering, a place in which eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, nor entered the heart of man the things which I prepared for those who love me. Like, I want to hear those words. Because I lived with him here. So heaven is just the continuity of it. I want heaven here and heaven for all eternity. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Any questions?